people who don't know One Digital was a UK wide digital inclusion program. It was a, a collaborative partnership. We were one of the lead collaborative partners along with AGK, Clarion Futures, which is part of the Housing Association Group, Digital Unite, and the Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations. And each of these organisations took a slightly different approach to digital inclusion, but united by the idea of using a digital champion approach. In other words, recruiting people who would in some way uh, help people with digital skills. Uh, they might be staff, they might be volunteers, paid or volunteers. And um, the, the projects took different approaches to that around the UK, obviously. Um, and through that project as a whole, we together engaged about 3,900 organisations, recruited nearly 5,000 digital champions and supported over 61,000 people over a, a three-year three -year period of what was called phase two. Citizens Online specifically, we have a particular model um, which we were testing and learning. This is a lottery funded project, um, test and learn project. And our project involved these different elements. So an element of discovery where we would do research about an area, we would engage with organisations, we would consult, we'd do surveys, produce what's called a digital maturity assessment for some key organisations in an area. We'd then do some design, we'd come up with a kind of action plan for an organisation particularly around building the capacity of, of other organisations in a digital inclusion network. Then we ourselves would do some delivery work. So we might recruit digital champions or train them. We provide digital skills through them. We'd also provide some digital leadership workshops that are more about a strategic level changes. And finally, we look at the impact we've created. So as, a, as the research manager, I'd be producing an evaluation report and we'd be attempting to learn from what we achieved. So before I get started on taking you through some of the findings, it's worth saying that the evaluation report in full is on our website and it's, there's, a, there's a short executive summary, which is roughly what I'm going to be going through today. And then there's a lot of appendices for the different aspects of that research. So we were looking really at whether our work had been effective, whether it was scalable, in other words, whether it could be adopted at larger scales or adopted in other parts of the country and whether it was sustainable, whether that once the funding had run out, other funding sources could be identified or the work could be continued in some other way. And in particular, we're interested in our switch model, um, which has different elements, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, we, we operated this around the country. So we had two what we call deep dive projects in Brighton and Hove, which were where we had, where we had paid people working. And um, we then did we were intended to do 20 what we called switch projects around the country. We actually ended up doing slightly fewer than that, but in Dorset, Surrey, Epping Forest, Harrogate, other places where we were involved for about six months and, and did a report and some workshops. And finally, in that's, that's about the last three years, which most of this evaluation was about. We also did some work in, in Plymouth and the Highlands in the earlier part of the programme, which was also referenced a little bit in this evaluation. So the, the switch model, what we call is, we, we like to think of it as a whole system approach to digital inclusion. So that starts off with what we call a baseline. We produce a report looking at the area, mapping the landscape, looking at which kind of organisations in, are involved in an area and what the levels of risk of digital exclusion are. And then we have these, these three elements, trying to achieve digital journeys, trying to look at the things that people might be wanting to achieve digitally and improving the processes around them in terms of uh, making them accessible to people, but also triaging and signposting anyone who couldn't complete a digital process, like applying for housing benefit or something like that. What we called enhancing provision and plugging gaps, which is basically making sure there was more digital skills training available and particularly looking if there were geographic areas or thematic areas where people weren't able to access the support that they needed. And amplifying marketing, trying to just increase the level of publicity about the availability of digital skills training. And lastly, there's that element of reporting and monitoring and evaluation. And just to give you an idea of some of the things we've looked at. So we've, we, we did a piece of research specifically about digital champions. We wanted to, to look at how they've been recruited, how much help they were providing, what their opinions were about things. We looked at the geographic distribution of where people had been helped and what that could tell us, which we're going to talk a little bit more later. We looked at the types of digital skills that people have been helped with. Um, we did 
an activity snapshot analysis. Fran is going to talk about that later. Where we looked at one week, what was happening in one week. We looked in detail at the, the deep dive projects, Digital Brighton and Hove, Digital Gwynedd. We looked at where we deployed professional digital champions, people we'd employed and were paying to, to do digital champion work, what, what kind of impact that had. We looked at the value of the, the baseline reports, these, these um, research products that we've given to people. We interviewed the project managers, we did surveys with, with partners, and we looked at these, these websites we created, which we referred to as signposting websites, which listed available support in an area. I'll hand over to Fran to say a little bit about our, our targets and, and what happened at the kind of headline level. Yeah, I was going to say, these are, these are the headline numbers from our work during phase two. So each of these three represents one of the main uh, targets, performance indicators that we were trying to hit. And um, as you can see, 979 digital champions recruited, um, which actually um, more than the initial, just more than the initial, initial target we had of 900. 25, 106% um, achievement on that. Um, so a great number of digital champions recruited. And then those digital champions then supported, uh, as you can see, nearly 15,000 individuals, in, um, unique individuals with digital skills, which was uh, way more than our um, KPI of 8,500. So 174% um, achievement. Um, Hoping that I'm coming across okay. People hear me all right. Um, so those were achieved. Unfortunately, when it comes to organisations engaged, we, um, we didn't quite achieve the, the target, which was 1,250. Um, so we only achieved 62% of our of our target on that. So a balanced picture. But what's worth saying is that even though we didn't engage quite as many organisations as we'd hoped to, we found that process. Uh, trickier, particularly as James already mentioned, the number of switch projects that we started wasn't quite up to the, what we'd hoped it would be. And we, even within the, those projects, we didn't uh, necessarily manage to engage all the organisations we'd hoped to. But even with that borne in mind, we still um, very much exceeded uh, the number of individuals helped, which ultimately is kind of you know, the, the bottom line in a way. So it just goes to show, um, yeah. Yeah, in a way, what we learned is that we, we didn't need to engage as many organisations as we thought we might to in order to reach those other targets. Um, That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So to move on, I mean, the, the, the big headline, which is perhaps a little bit obvious and lots of people would be expect anyway, is that we do think digital champion approaches work um, through recruiting relatively small numbers of um, skilled people. You can achieve quite large interventions that help a lot of people in a relatively short amount of time um, through the activity snapshot that we ran where we asked people to tell us about what they did in a week we found that digital champions were helping on average 10 people a week some of them were helping as many as 24 people in a in a single day so there's quite a range of how much people people helped one thing that we found is that when we did that one week snapshot we tended to get a lot higher engagement with reporting than when we were asking people to record every single person that they helped. So found much higher levels of activity than we were getting through our, our standard measures of, of monitoring. Um, one of the things we were interested in is the types of digital champions and how much help they provided. So we had quite a focus on what we call embedded digital champions. So I mentioned a professional digital champion, which is someone that we refer to as someone who's paid to do that job exclusively. That's what they do, they help people with digital skills. A volunteer digital champion is someone who's doing that without any form of payment, you know, contributing out of the goodness of their heart. And then an embedded digital champion is someone who, who has another job, could be a frontline customer service job, but as part of that job, they do a bit of digital skills work. Might be a lower amount, but we think they're really important. That's a particularly um, sustainable system of recruiting digital champions. Their, their funding is therefore coming from the organisation that's hosting them. Can be difficult but we found that they've on average helped three times as many people as people who are just recruited as volunteers. And perhaps for obvious reasons, because they're, they're doing the work more time, but um, nonetheless, we think that's an important finding. Okay, Thanks, so, I'm tell you a little bit about the professional digital champions. Yeah, so another thing we were interested to find out was how effectively we had managed to help people who were living in the most uh, or more deprived 
uh, areas that we were working in. So across the four deep dive projects, uh, Plymouth Highland, Gwynedd and Brighton and Hove, we looked at um, where people live. So when a learner was helped, they would give us their postcode, we'd match those up to an LSOA, a, a small area, or in Scotland, a data zone, it's the, the equivalent. Uh, yeah, we, so we looked at where we'd helped, where digital champions had helped people. And if you look at the bottom chart, you can see that there's a sort of uh, good balance, but people, we generally helped people on the left. So the left end of those charts is where um, areas are more deprived in general. Um, if you compare to the top, which is just the professional DCs that were employed to do this work, you can see there's quite a strong skew to the left. So professional DCs um, were helping people predominantly in the most deprived, who, came, who live in the most deprived areas where they were living. And also, as um, if you, you probably can't quite see the scale, but the scale is quite different on the top chart there's a lot more sessions happening the professional digital champions were putting in a lot more sessions as you perhaps might expect um than the embedded and volunteer champions and um yeah on the whole they were much more likely to help learners who are living in the most uh, more deprived areas so that's a good finding <laughs> yeah for us it was important because it, it suggested that some of our efforts to target that work were effective it's much easier to communicate to someone that you would like them to go and run sessions in a certain place if you're paying them, if you're able to, to direct their activity, even if they're volunteers and they're, they're more likely to help where they can, which might not necessarily be in the places of greatest need. Um, just to go a little bit further on this, um, don't worry too much about these quite complex looking charts, but again, through using this postcode data, we were able to look at other um, metrics of where people we helped lived compared to where people with, for instance, higher numbers of pension credit claims, higher numbers of housing benefit claims lived. So we don't like to collect too much information from learners themselves. We find that's quite an onerous process for them. But what we can do is sort of these indicative statistics where we look at the areas those people came from. And what we found is that there's, for the start in the top left, more we help more people from areas where there are more people. That's like a control, you know, we, we would expect that there's just more people in those areas. So you help you get, have more people to help. One thing that we found is really interesting is if you just look at the number of people who are older in an area, that doesn't really help us predict how many people we helped in that area. However, if you use something like pension credit, which measures both age and lower income, that does help us explain why we helped more people in an area. And similarly, if you look at housing benefit, which obviously is a, a benefit for lower income people, who aren't of an older age, um, we see a similar thing. So it makes it feel like low income is a better predictor of where we help people than age, which, which fits a bit with what we were just saying about um, deprivation previously. Just to look at this in another way that's perhaps a bit more visually easy to understand. Um, when, we, when we produce maps for our baseline, we'd look at where are the areas with higher numbers of things like pension credit. So on this map, the areas that are highlighted in black with a black border, those are those areas with higher numbers of people receiving pension credit. And the ones with blue borders are then a step down, but again, a more elevated number than the rest of the areas. And then that sort of dot heat map where there's areas of purple is anywhere where someone was helped, a postcode where someone was helped. And as it rises through red and to yellow, more people were helped. So you can see you know, a lot of people in that center area of Brighton where there are two LSOAs with high numbers of pension credit claimants and out in Port Slade and then off to the, to the east, uh, to the west of that, those those were the, the main areas where we help people and they were associated with higher numbers of pension credit. So perhaps we start to use pension credit as a proxy indicator for digital exclusion. You know, it highlights two of these things that we know are risk factors, both age and lower income. So it can perhaps be useful to us in future when we're, we're looking for places to, to meet need. So another, another piece of learning from our evaluation was really about the importance, the vital importance of having somebody uh, in a local area who really sustains and holds together and drives forward um, a project. And we've called those super champions. So the example here um, that's pictured on the slide is um, Sally McMahon from the library service in Brighton and Hove. And she's been an incredible um, champion, <laughs> super champion, uh, champion of champions for the project in Brighton and Hove. I've had similar uh, support and encouragement um, from the library service in, in the Gwyneth project as well. Um, 
in our report, we talk about this kind of person being a linchpin, you know, other people may come and go, but they're the person who advocates and supports the project. And certainly in Brighton and Hove, the city council through the libraries is putting a lot of uh, funding to sustain the project as well. And it's just that person who keeps it going, who's inspiring, encouraging, who really champions the, the cause to get stuff delivered. And you can see, we can really see that clearly in the, the difference in the, the impact that that has on the project. Um, the project managers as well, we had, we had David Skur and Dan Richards leading those two deep life projects in Brighton and Gwyneth. And you know, they're also the people who have delivered that training to digital champions, built the network and so on. And, and uh, for a successful project, I think one of our pieces of learning from this evaluation is how important those super champions are. Yeah, we've also, you know, we, when we started this project, the idea for this, the, the 20 switch program areas was we would work in an area for six months and hope to achieve quite a lot in that time and leave them with something that they could go on to and unfortunately if we're really honest we find that really to to really achieve things at the scale and sustainability and of effectiveness that we would like to that engagement needs to be over a longer period in some of those projects we ended up being working with them for a longer period just because of the nature of the project but we've really found that in those those deep dive projects they've been able to achieve a lot more than than the, the length of time comparatively would imply, but just that, that you can really build that those relationships and develop trust and achieve things if you've got at least a year or two to, to really work things through. One thing that's been quite interesting um, from the, the interviews we did with um, some of the project managers is that we perhaps expected that things would be a little bit easier in terms of working with frontline staff sometimes. Um, the expectation was that we would be training these people to provide digital skills support to people they were interacting with to their customers. Often what has been described here is that the work was actually making the case that this was necessary. Uh, this has probably changed with COVID because those frontline customers are being required to go online for lots of reasons. But at the time that we were doing this work when people were, were not facing quite such that, that pressure, it was often difficult to convince people that there was this digitally excluded section of the population that needed support with these things and that they were going to be being asked more and more often to do things online. That it was no longer possible to just let people be offline and say, okay, well, we'll do it this different way for you now. People can often see themselves as part of this whole system where they would be triaging the need for, for digital skill support and signposting somewhere to where they could be receiving it. Finally, another thing that's interesting um, as the as the research manager, we we, we asked people to involved in the part, uh, partners involved in the projects to rate the different elements of the project in terms of how useful they were to them, which is this chart on the bottom, where six was the most useful and one was the least useful. Um, we're really glad that partnership development, which is a big part of our model, you know, we want people to be working in, in networks. We don't think any single organization can solve these problems by themselves, was really highly rated. Professional digital champions, again, volunteer digital champions, training for staff, all these things were, were really well rated. What's interesting is that the research and the baseline work was perhaps not so highly rated. Lots of people found these long reports were not things that they could read or, or utilize. Nonetheless, we think that because of some of the things that I was talking about in the previous slide, that creating that evidence base for digital change can be essential to the success of digital inclusion networks. In some places, they needed that report in order to be able to do the work. But the, the blunt truth is it's not always the most cost-effective approach to tackling digital exclusion itself. So there's a difficult piece of learning there about how we refine the type of work we do, make it both useful, but also more easily digestible and more cost-effective. Um, you'll notice that at the bottom of that line, monitoring and evaluation is the, the least valued piece of, of what we were doing. Um, and, and I think mostly that's about communicating it. You know, it's not something that we're always talking about when we're doing work. We're much more focused on the delivery, but it's also probably just a reality of this, that it's, it's not the thing people are interested in. It's of interest to me as the research manager in terms of how we develop our projects in the future. It's not necessarily essential to everyone as the project is actually running. So I hope that's interesting. Um, I don't know whether we've got any questions. Um, I will, I'll come out of the screen sharing and we'll, I'll get to see some faces, wave hello. And uh, yeah, I haven't seen any questions yet, James, but plenty of time. <laughs> Not too far away. 
I think we'll be in a situation where you can, yeah, if you just want to unmute Jan and... Um... Hi. Um, very interested in your project. Uh, two questions, comments. Um, I do a lot of work for Citizens Advice and I don't see Citizens Advice mentioned in your work and I'm wondering if you've tried to contact them and they they don't say yes or whatever. And then the other comment is about the evaluation and monitoring. Um, although it's a bind and people don't want to read it and so on, of course the people who do want it are the funders. So it's got to exist. Yes. So I'll go in reverse order. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, the lack of value that's placed on it by the partners isn't, it absolutely isn't a reason not to do it. We've, we've had to do a, a monitoring evaluation. I'm, I'm proud of what we've done. You know, that's why we're running today's session to sort of introduce it to you and to encourage you to go and have a look at the documents in full. Um, it is worth saying that we're quite glad that the, the new piece of work we're doing for the lottery, um, we're just we're really glad to have been funded to do, to, to extend some of this work around COVID specifically, we'll be expanding our, our work in Brighton and Hope to cover Sussex and we'll be starting a, or developing a project we've recently started in North Yorkshire that will go, be going beyond the work we did in Harrogate covering the whole of the, the county council area. And their requirements around monitoring are a bit softer than they were in the case of this, this one digital project. With this one digital project, as you will see, if you have a look at all the documentation, we, we, we promised a lot in terms of what we would monitor and what we would evaluate and it's all really interesting stuff there's lots of learning there but it was a lot of work that when covid hit it was very difficult to us to do to quite the level we were we were planning to we have done a, an enormous amount of work but it was a lot of rushing together in the middle of covid at the end so um it's good for us to be able to minimize those requirements when we can in terms of citizens' advice, we, we do work with them. In fact, in Brighton and Hove, um, they were one of the, the lead network partners for that, um, that project in that, in that area. They're one of the steering group, steering group members. Um, in the other switch project areas, when we approach, they're one of the main organisations that we go to to fill in the organisational surveys that we do to find out what's already going on in an area. Um, we know that one of the main things that people have an issue with at the moment is applying for universal credit and Citizens Advice have a scheme, which you'll obviously know about, where they um, help to claim, where they, they are funded by the government to help people to do the digital application. Um, so we do work with them. We, we integrate. It's sometimes occasionally funny. We might get a, the odd email or something or phone call where someone is probably looking for Citizens Advice and gets us instead. Um, but yeah, we, we do work with them. Um, Thank you. Thanks. And any other questions? Yeah, I've got a query. The more we talk about it and we sort of think the training is the easy bit, which I know isn't the case, but the harder bit and the bit that everyone keeps raising is that, as you say, it's all linked to income and having been able to afford the kit and the data just seems to be a massive barrier that, you know, when you're working on a county level, it seems very difficult to overcome. Yeah. It's interesting. I might um, get Brian in, in a minute to talk a bit about some of the things that are happening in Brighton and Hove around this. But what's interesting is that until COVID hit, the, the conversation in lots of digital inclusion circles was not ignoring those problems of data poverty and access to devices, but was much more talking about digital skills and increasingly talking about motivation. So there was a lot of talk about how the portion of people that were, were still not online at all about half of them said that nothing would convince them to get online so this was a big issue for the sector everyone was thinking about how how, how do we talk to these people how do we encourage them to think about it um what type of support should we be providing otherwise what else does it mean for things that are digital by, by default that sort of thing and when covid has hit suddenly the questions of access to devices you know multiple devices when people have got school children at home someone needs to work children need to be doing remote learning at the same time and, and data poverty have suddenly been really brought brought up again. Um, we've we've tried to do some things around this, and in fact, the next the next session that we're going to do in this series of webinars is probably going to be on the question of data poverty specifically. Um, but it's it's 
it is tricky. Ultimately, we're not talking about necessarily a problem which is about digital at all. We're talking about an inequality problem and a, and a financial problem, which takes it a bit beyond our, our remit. I mean, yeah. Brian, do you want to shall I hand over just to get different voices on the call? Would you just like to say a bit about the, the what, what you've been doing in Brighton and Hove with the tablet schemes and um, with Tech Take Back and those things? Yeah, so um, yeah, we've got a number of projects that are running. So, for example, um, we have a device loan scheme, which we run with devices.now. And the great thing about that project is, as you can imagine, it's giving people the opportunity to experience what it's like to be online. <clears throat> so there's two things. So there's, do they have the tech one or do they have the ability to connect to each other? So we provide the, with the tech with a SIM. We absorb the cost of uh, connectivity. Uh, we used to have a, a data plan for like around six gig or something like that. <clears throat> but anyone who's got an Android or any device knows, do a couple of updates and then that's your data allowance gone. So we just have a rolling contract and we absorb that cost. So the project's going extremely well. Not only do we uh, set up the tablet and uh, distribute it, uh, we work with our, with our partners within the network uh, and we do a needs analysis and then we supply uh, the equipment. We also provide the digital champion support. So it's great saying, oh, here you go. And yes, here's the internet, but can you use it? Well, if you can't, we will help you do that bit too. So that's great. So we're looking to expand our work, increase, or, and in some cases, re-engage our existing digital champions to support that work now it's going really well as you can imagine but one of the kind of wars that we are about to hit is at the end of that two three month loan period um, and you have to say to Mavis you've got to be the bailiff oh all right, all right, come on hand it back give it back she's just gone hey look at all this it's fantastic yeah all right that's it turn the lights off close the windows that's it hand it over so we're looking at ways to work around that. One of the ways that we are hoping we, that will bear fruit is uh, partnering with an organization called Tech Take Back. Um, and what they do, if you haven't heard of them, they uh, re, re take old uh, equipment, surgically data, cleanse it, uh, uh, repurpose it, and then sell it back little to nothing. Uh, if we can get funding for that, that's obviously that's great but that's their business model anyway so they've got a, a program which they've just launched this week uh they got a, a, a thing they've got a electric van uh, which can pick up and drop off uh some of that that tech uh, we're going to be supporting them to launch that and to get that off the ground but that's some of the interesting ways that we're trying to uh, circumvent that bit when people get to the end of that loan period, what do they then do? You know, so you've gone digitally included. No, actually, you're back to digitally excluded. But that's just not going to work. So you're trying to make it work as a more consistent and equitable approach because it's great to loan. And then the other thing is, what do you just buy to give? And then what happens? Then the next criticism is going to be, the device is a bit of a purpose. You can only do this on it. You're going to do that. So, you know, we're trying to work it, work it as a model to get the right sort of delivery model. But I think in in the main, let's deal with the people that are most vulnerable in society. They were vulnerable anyway, and COVID has just made them fall even deeper in the cracks in society. So we're trying to just uh, get that model right, continue that support. The first thing we've uh, decided to do is um, if someone feels they still have the need at the end of that two month period, we're going to extend it. Um, um, that unfortunately means people on the waiting list still have to wait, but I think let's let's deal with what we got and crack those eggs and cross those rows when we get there. Yeah, just, just to say a few more things about this. I mean, um, one is that as Brian says, you know, the key thing is what happens to someone at the end of the loan scheme. But um, the day, on the data side of it, there are, it's always worth us saying, there are um, some things that the government has done and some options available to people. So there, you're, 
then we lifted data caps, which means that people are basically more likely if they have a fixed broadband connection to be able to have unlimited data. Um, there are some, some things which have been zero rated for data that's accessed through mobile signal for 4G things. So some NHS websites and things like that. Um, there, there's, I think, a few education websites which have been zero rated for data, but there's been, we've shared an article this week where there's been a call for more of those websites to be zero rated for the people who are using mobile signal to for their children to access um, resources from schools because otherwise it's extremely costly to be doing that on a pay-as-you-go basis. Um, the two uh, broadband schemes which we highlight or we, we have in the past highlighted one and as of today we can highlight two so there's there's BT Basic plus broadband it's always worth mentioning to people in case they haven't heard of it before that's a, a £10 a month offer which covers a basic phone line and you get um, broadband access with it. The difficulty with it is you have to be on a, a set of um, particular low income benefits. And then today we've just heard that Virgin have, have launched a similar product. It's £15 a month. The requirements are slightly different. So it's available to anyone on universal credit. The, the BT scheme is some other benefits, but universal credit only if you're on um, zero earnings. Obviously the way that universal credit works, a lot of people are topping up low earnings. So there are there are some of those kind of schemes out there. Um, GiftGaff also have a scheme where data can be gifted and people can access, um, access uh, free data through that. But it really doesn't feel like there's anything really sufficient to tackle the problem at the moment. So I think there's gonna be a lot more discussion of this, a lot more talk about it and a lot more work on it. And as I say, we'll, We'll try to focus a bit more on that um, next time. So, yeah, there's a great question from Lisa in the in the chat, but also part of me would quite like to hear a bit from Alexia about the digital enablement in Hampshire. But I'm not sure if now's quite the right time. For that. But yeah, it'd be interesting to catch up after. That's fine. Pop <laughs> emails. Okay, uh, Lisa, do you wanna do you wanna say your question? Um, sorry, my question was just about, um, clearly you, you've spoken about the paid um, champions having more um, effect, um, supporting more people, but obviously there's the cost implication to that. And I was just interested to have some idea of what that cost implication is and how that scales out. You know, um, I don't know how quite to put it, but I'm, I'm, if it's three times more successful, what is the investment needed to be that su extra successful? I think that's, that's, you know, with all, with all of those digital champion approaches, whether it's professional, embedded or volunteer, they all have their pros and cons. It's not like we can say that one is the best way. And when organisations don't have the money to resource professional digital champions, they don't have the money to resource them. That's, that's just the way things are. But I think what we're trying to emphasise, at least at that more strategic level, is that you know you really can achieve a lot more if you can get at least some of those people paid because they're then able to train volunteer digital champions and that sort of thing um, and and from the projects that we've done it really has made quite a significant difference in places where we've had at least one person who's paid in places where we've had to rely um rely on running a system without that i hope that makes sense kind of answers your question I can't hear you now, Lisa. You might, you might be on. Yes, thank, yes, thanks very much. Cheers. Um, any other questions? Or I mean, I, we we probably could have a little from you, Alexia, about. Uh... No more questions from anybody. There's got to be. Well, we just, we just had one in from Magda, so I guess like we could we could talk about that one. Um, you, let me, I've lost it now, but I want to get the. Um, it's come privately to me. So Magda says, do you have digital champions who work mostly with black, Asian or minority ethnic people? Um, in Citizens Online, we've not recruited people specifically to do that. And I don't think we've, whether, whether they're volu volunteer um, or professional. When we talk about embedded digital champions, one of the reasons that we, we like to talk about the value that they have is that people often ask how to reach the people that are digitally excluded. 
And one of our answers is to do the type of mapping that we sort of showed you one example of in the presentation. The other is to, to work with the organisations that are working with people who are digitally excluded directly. So some of those organisations will be organisations that have a, uh, a group of people they're working with who are more likely to be um, in, the, in the BAME group. Um, we've previously run a session, I mean, this is not really related because they're, they're different issues really, but one of the other things that comes up sometimes when we talk about this sort of thing is people with English as an additional language. And while we haven't done work around that specifically, one of our partners in the One Digital Programme, um, Clarion Futures, they emphasise some work about this, they produce some work that's on the One Digital website about working in those situations. Um, they had a uh, a project which was in Tower Hamlets, can't remember the exact name of the, the centre, but where the, the client base was particularly Bangladeshi and Poplahaka. Poplahaka. And um, emphasise that when you're when you're providing digital skills in that area, it's really helpful to have people who um, the, rec the digital examiners you've recruited are coming from similar areas. You know, they're local. Usually, the digital um, examiners we're recruiting are from the local area, but in that case, people who speak the same same languages um, as, if not their first mm. language, then an additional language. Instead. So they can, you know, if you need to switch out of a language or you need to use the language that a learner is using to describe something on the screen themselves, that might be slightly easier. I mean, there's a lot more to that topic than I want yeah. to hear, but the key point really is that thing about who you're, you know, that we, we, it tends not to be us who is providing that digital skills support directly in these instances. We're creating digital inclusion networks of other organisations that are coming together mm. and, and relying on their expertise in terms of their, their client groups. Yeah, if I, if I just add to that, actually, it was probably by both ends, so it's just come from. But um, yeah, I think if you think about the way in which we work, um, uh, we are Borg, um, so we replicate. Um, so, you know, you get involved with us and we teach best practice. Um, and we recruit based on persona rather than skill set. Um, so you need to be a type of person in order to engage. It's not uh, whether or not you know the latest Apple OS or, or what's going on with Windows. You need to be able to engage and communicate <laughs> unlike a Borg uh, as a human. So um, I think that's the irony. It, and, um, but we work through our, our providers, as James just said. And the key bit is being able to work directly with people that have those core support groups. While we may have a demographic that um, are kind of elderly and vulnerable, we don't have the skill set to engage them. So we don't do befriending and stuff like that. But we will teach befrienders or people working with those hard to reach groups how to be the best digital champion. That's, that's it. And, and for anyone who hasn't seen before, you know, we have a whole series of these webinars that we ran earlier in the year when we were doing it once a week rather than once a month, which are about, you know, how to, to, how to work as a digital champion remotely during the pandemic when you're much less likely to be working face to face and potentially some of those things about helping people through your organisation are a little bit different. You're not necessarily seeing them come through the door. It relies more on the contact details you have for those people. I think it's probably time for us to start wrapping up. So I'll start sharing my screen again and uh, share a few resources as I said I would. So the first of those is just to remind you that um, you can have a look at this report. As you can see, there's one link at the top for the, the report itself. And then you can have a look through all these appendices if there's a particular issue that you're interested in. Um, for instance, there's one around the DC approaches and one around that professional digital champion deployment, which might be of interest um, to you, Lisa. There's also the evaluation reports from the other partners in the, the One Digital program. I haven't had much time to talk about those today. Um, they all have different um, focuses. So we're looking at different ways those projects were run and um, different outcomes that were being sought. Um, we will shortly, through some work that we've done with Clarion Futures, be um, publishing and talking about on a webinar some um, evaluation we did of a piece of research they did or the data that they collected around the people that they helped 
where they had around um, 7,000 survey responses through the, the work they were doing, particularly with people who were seeking employment. It's also worth mentioning that there is an evaluation toolkit on the gov.uk website. Um, it's a few years old now, but this is something that myself and a few others from Citizen and Brian worked on at the time, as well as people from other organisations in the sector. So if you're looking to design an evaluation for a digital inclusion project that you're running, then that's a good place to, to go. In terms of wider research, it might also be worth mentioning that we've, we've previously done a webinar on this, but we have a, um, a big piece of research work we did for Public Health England around um, looking at digital exclusion and population screening programmes. And while that work is very specific in terms of what we are being asked to do, it's an equality impact assessment around a particular channel shift programme, it might be of interest to those of you that have been interested in the way we've monitored and evaluated the, the One Digital work. And lastly, we have resources which we've collated which are about more direct delivery in terms of things that might be of interest to people as you're supporting people through COVID-19. So that's everything. Thanks.